Good morning. Welcome to St. Helena Catholic Church for the celebration of the fourth Sunday in Ordinary Time. It is a joy to worship with you today. In order to preserve the sacredness of this Eucharistic celebration, we ask that all phones be silenced and out of reverence, please refrain from texting and chewing gum during Mass. As Catholics, we fully participate in the celebration of the Eucharist when we receive Holy Communion. We are encouraged to receive communion devoutly and frequently. In order to be properly prepared to receive communion, Catholic participants should not be conscious of grave sin and should have fasted for one hour. A person who is conscious of grave sin is not to receive the body and blood of the Lord without prior sacramental confession. If you are not of our faith or outside the church, please come forward and receive a blessing. The readings for today are found in the Journeys Songbooks, number 938B. Please stand and join in our gathering hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you to St. Helena Church. It's very good to be back home after my pilgrimage to Medjugorje, and I'll be saying more about that trip during my homily today. But as we come now before the Lord, let us prepare to give him thanks as we first call to mind our sin and humbly beg the Lord's forgiveness. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary of a Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sin, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy.
let us pray. Grant us, Lord our God, that we may honor you with all our mind and love everyone in truth of heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. If we have any children who are here for our children's church today, if you come forward at this time. <laughs> Great. Well, good kids, let's say a little prayer before you go, okay? Lord Jesus, as we come before you on this chilly Sunday morning, we give you thanks. We thank you, Jesus, for, these pres for the presence of these children in our midst who remind us, Lord, of open and humble and trusting hearts, the hearts that you call us to have as we come before you. And as you go forth to study God's holy word, may the Spirit of God open your minds and hearts to all the gifts that he desires to give. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses spoke to all the people, saying, A prophet like me will the Lord, your God, raise up for you from among your own kin, to whom shall listen. This is exactly what you requested of the Lord, your God, at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not again hear the voice of the Lord, our God, nor see this great fire any more, lest we die. And the Lord said to me, This was well said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kin, and will put my words into his mouth. He shall tell them all that I command him. Whoever will not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name, I myself will make him answer for it. But if a prophet, prophet presumes to speak in my name, an oracle that I have not commanded him to speak, or speaks in the name of other gods, he shall die. The word of the Lord. Today you would hear his 
voice Harden not your hearts at Mary As in the day of Massa in the desert Where your fathers tempted me They tested me though they had seen my works reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, I should like you to be free of anxieties. An unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But a married man is anxious about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and he is divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is anxious about the things of the Lord so that she may be holy in both body and spirit. A married woman, on the other hand, is anxious about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. I am telling you this for your own benefit, not to impose a restraint upon you, but for the sake of propriety and adherence to the Lord without distraction. The word of the Lord. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Then they came to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. The people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In their synagogue was a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him and said, Quiet, come out of him. The unclean spirit convulsed him with a loud cry and came out of him. All were amazed and asked one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. His fame spread everywhere throughout the whole region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord.
I think most of you know that I just got back a couple of days ago from a pilgrimage to Medjugorje. In fact, I was away for two weekends, and during that time, Father Robert Merced, our good friend and neighbor from Hammond, who's the provincial superior of the Dominicans in the southern province, said Mass here at St. Helena each and every day, and I want to publicly thank him for taking care of our parish while I was away. The trip that I made to Medjugorje was my fourth pilgrimage there over a span of 35 years. I first went in 1989. It turned out to be a very powerful and new experience for me and also for the priest that I was traveling with, Father David Dawson. And we also had at the beginning of the trip, Father, or rather Bishop Joseph Strickland with us for four days. And there were a group of 50 pilgrims who traveled with us too. And I have to say at the end of the trip, it left me wanting more. And I felt the desire to go back to Medjugorje one day, hopefully in the not too far distant future. Now, having said that, I'd be the first to admit that getting to Medjugorje is not an easy trip. It takes a sacrifice to get there, time and money and effort and travel and so on. But I would say to any and all of you, if you ever have the opportunity to go, I would encourage you to do so. On the other hand, if you never get to go there, in body at least, be assured that God is still calling you to be a pilgrim. Because after all, this is what the life of a Christian here on earth really is. Our life here on earth is truly a pilgrimage to God. Here on earth, we have no permanent home. Sometimes we think of ourselves as being at home. We think we're going to be here forever. But of course, that's not true. In fact, we're all really living even now, no matter how young or old we are, on borrowed time. We're being tested by God. This is a time of probation for us. We're also be, being called by God's Son, Jesus Christ, to follow him because he is the one who will lead us and shepherd us to heaven and to God, our Heavenly Father. He wants us to make a firm decision right here, right now, to live with God forever and to be with him in our heavenly home. And so, even now, we are preparing for the day of our death. And I want to emphasize this truth, namely that none of us goes to God alone. That's impossible to do. That's why God has given us family and friends. That's why he's given us a parish church community to belong to this beautiful Church of St. Helena here in Amit, Louisiana. And I have to say, as I was flying back home from Medjugorje, I began to think of how blessed I am to come to a place, to come back to a place where people truly believe in God and sacrifice for him, a place of penance and prayer, a place where people are searching for God and striving to live in communion with him, a place where so many hearts are open to the Lord and hungering and thirsting for him, a place where the presence of our Lord Jesus is very real and strong, a place where the mother of Jesus is known and loved and revered, a place where people believe in the mercy of God and repent and confess their sins and put their trust in him a place where people receive the word of God with joy and put it into practice in their daily lives, a place where people reach out to their neighbor in time of need, just as they would reach out to our Lord Jesus himself, a place where the spiritual and corporal works of mercy are practice, a place where Jesus is the king and the center of so many hearts. And I'm not saying these things about our parish just to make you feel good. I'm saying that because it is true. I'm saying it with a humble 
and grateful heart. And so never take our parish community for granted because you won't find this kind of faith and trust in God everywhere else that you go. Now today I want to speak about Father Mark Beard. You know, it struck me that once I got to Medjugorje and people found out that I was from Louisiana, even though that they, they didn't know that I was from St. Helena, everybody there was asking me the same question. Did I know Father Mark Beard? Of course, we all know that Father Mark frequently went to Medjugorje. He was there at least 10 times that I know of. In fact, many of you in this parish went to Medjugorje with him throughout the years. Father Mark first went to Medjugorje in the year 2000, and it was a key moment in his adult conversion to Christ. He went, as you know, first of all, as a skeptic because his father told him to go there. And yet when he came back home to his mom and dad and his family and friends and to his place of work and business, he came back in many ways a changed man. It's not that he didn't believe in God before. It's not that he didn't know the Lord Jesus before he went. But he came back from that first pilgrimage in the year 2000 with a deeper faith and a more open and generous and pure heart and with a very powerful desire to know the will of God for him and to accomplish it in his own life. He came back with a new and much deeper relationship with Our Lady, the Mother of God, to whom he consecrated himself totally. That's why at the end of every Mass, we always say the totus tuus prayer, which he taught to all of us. And of course, it was Our Lady who would lead him in a very powerful way to her Son, Jesus Christ. I don't need to tell you that Father Mark was an intense man. Not long after I became the pastor of his home parish of Our Lady of Mercy in Baton Rouge, that was in the year 2001, not long after that, Father Mark discerned that he was being called to study for the priesthood in the seminary. And at first he was afraid to tell his father who had asked him to go to Medjugorje the news. In fact, he was so hesitant because he had always worked in the family business alongside his dad, whom he called chief, since he was a boy. And he couldn't tell him face to face and so he wrote out a letter on business stationery. And one day he went to his parents' home. He said his mom and dad were sitting in their recliners side by side. And he handed his father the letter that he wrote. And when Harold Beard opened the letter, I knew Harold well, very wise man. Many of you knew him too. He opened the letter and he read it. And he looked up at Mark and he said, son, what took you so long? And so in answer to the question that people kept asking me, did you know Father Mark Beard? I was very happy to tell them that, yes, I knew Father Mark. I admired him. I watched him grow into a powerful man of God, a holy priest. I could see that he was on fire for the Lord. I treasured the long conversations that we had in my office at Our Lady of Mercy, both before and after he was ordained. We became very close friends. And of course, it was at his invitation almost two years ago that I had the great privilege of coming here, both to Our Lady of Hope in Chattawa, the retreat center there, and also here to the beautiful parish of St. Helena, and to work side by side with Mark for that last year and a half of his life. That's why I'm here today. One very important thing that I learned about Father Mark in the course of this pilgrimage was the significance of the date on which he died, August the 2nd of this past year. August the 2nd, I learned after his death is the feast of Our Lady, Queen of Angels. 
But I really didn't know much about that feast because it isn't widely known or celebrated here in our part of the world. It's not even listed in the Ardo, which is the little book that we get throughout the province of New Orleans, to which we all belong, that tells us what feast to celebrate every day at Mass. And the reason for that is very simple. You see, the feast of Our Lady Queen of Angels is a Franciscan feast. For more than 400 years, the parish in Medjugorje has been under the pastoral care of the Capuchin Franciscan order. And in fact, in that part of the world, the province of Herzegovina, where 95% of the people are Catholic and where most, almost everybody practices the faith, the Franciscans have exercised pastoral care for the people who live there, as I said, for four centuries. And during those four centuries, they've suffered all kinds of persecutions against the faith, from the Ottoman Turks 400 years ago and then later on from the Russians and the communists and so on, Many of the Franciscans have shed their blood for Christ in that place. And many of the Catholic faithful have shed their blood for Christ as well. I had the opportunity to do a lot of reading on this trip, and one thing I noticed is that so many of the Franciscans who died for Christ died on important anniversaries and feast days. And the feast that is celebrated on August the 2nd kept coming up to me over and over again, at least a half a dozen times in my reading while I was there. And I want to tell you a little bit of the background of the feast. You see, when St. Francis of Assisi, who lived 800 years ago, went through his own conversion to Christ, he was about 18 years old when he felt the call of the Lord in a very powerful way. At that time, he was praying in a little abandoned chapel outside of Assisi. I know some of you have been there and have visited it. It's known as San Damiano. 800 years ago, it was in serious disrepair and had been abandoned. And one day, months after sitting before the crucifix, and you've all seen that crucifix in the chapel, so he heard the Lord Jesus speaking to him in his heart. And our Lord said to him, Francesco, rebuild my church. Frances Francesco, rebuild my church. And Francis took this word of the Lord in a very literal way, and all by himself he began to rebuild and to repair that little chapel. But as he was doing that over a period of months, he began to realize that the Lord meant something more. And so he gave up his former way of life. He was the son of a very wealthy merchant. Unlike Mark's father, he wanted him to stay in the family business. But Francis took off his fine clothes and he put on the tattered brown robe of a beggar, tying a rope around his waist. And he took a vow of celibacy and poverty. And he gathered a group of companions around him who would follow him in his own personal rule of life. After some years, he decided that he would go to Rome and ask the Pope, Pope Innocent III, for permission to found a new religious community in, church who, in the church who would try to live like Jesus and his first disciples, the apostles. In other words, live as a group of itinerant preachers who would live in poverty, who would dedicate themselves to prayer, but who would do everything possible as they traveled around, and especially among the poor to spread the gospel of God. In this way, he felt that he would fulfill the Lord's will to rebuild the church. Now, before Francis reached Rome, it turns out that the Pope had had a prophetic dream about this little man. Francis was small. And in fact, in his dream, he saw a little man 
holding up with his arms an abandoned church that was about to fall. And for a long time, the Pope wasn't even told that Francis was out there dressed like a beggar waiting, begging to see him. Until finally the Pope's advisor said this, this little guy who's been out there for a long time that wants to see you, but he's just a beggar. The Pope realized that this man was the fulfillment of his dream and he welcomed Francis and he gave him permission to establish a new community in the church. When Francis and his friends went back to Assisi, they didn't go to the little chapel of San Damiano. They went to another little chapel, which is down in the valley. Assisi is a beautiful town set on a hill, but down in the valley, there was a small abandoned chapel known as the Chapel of Our Lady, Queen of Angels. And they began to restore that chapel, and it would become their spiritual home. They built cells all around it where they themselves would live. They dug a place for a hedge, kind of making a cloister for their religious community. It was there that St. Francis finally wrote his rule. It was there that he founded the Franciscan order. It was there that St. Clare, his good friend who followed him, took her first vows, becoming a contemplative nun and following other women to live as she lived. It was also there that Francis, at the age of 46, almost blind by this time and bearing in his own body the wounds of Jesus Christ in his hands, in his feet, in his side, the first recorded saint to bear the stigmata of Jesus. He knew that he was dying, and he asked his, his companions to lay him out on the floor of that little chapel. And it was there on October the 3rd in the year 1226 that Francis breathed his last breath. And the Franciscans believed that Our Lady, the Queen of Angels, sent her angels to receive his soul and to bring him to the throne of God. It was on that day, that feast, August the 2nd, that Father Mark went to God in a very sudden way. Everybody that I spoke to in Medjugorje where that feast is celebrated kept reminding me of the significance of the day on which Father Mark went to God. I have so much more that I'd, I'd like to say, but I don't have to, time to say all of it today. But I would like to make use of the coming uh, season of Lent, the 40 days of Lent, which begins just a couple of weeks from now on Wednesday, February 14th. This year it falls on Valentine's Day. I want to give a number of talks during Lent about the messages of Our Lady at Medjugorje, the powerful truths that I was reminded of on this trip. You see, Our Lady is calling us to conversion in this time. She's been appearing in Medjugorje now for 42 years on a daily basis, if you can believe it. And she's calling us to a more perfect relationship with her son, Jesus Christ, because the time is short. We live in a critical time. In the gospel today, we see Jesus casting out a, a whole host, a legion of unclean spirits from a poor man who was present in the synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath day when Jesus himself was there and was preaching. I truly believe that that man represents our world today and especially our Western world, which has become so anti-God, a culture in which God is cast out and we're constantly receiving garbage and untruth and so many evil things, the spirit of lust and immorality. That man represents our world, which is so enthralled to Satan today, who is the prince of this world. And so next weekend, I'll have more to say. In the meantime, if, if you want to do a penance, you can watch a one hour and 15 minute video that was recorded, uh, an interview with me while I was in Medjugorje. It was on Monday of this week. Um, and there I discuss many of the things that I've, I've brought up this morning. It's on a 
YouTube channel called Tom Medjugorje. And the video is entitled Testimony for the Miles of the USA. And as I said, I'll have more to say to you next weekend. Our Lady Queen of Peace, pray for us. Our Lady Queen of Angels, pray for us. O Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, I trust in you. I invite you to rise now, and together let's make our profession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. He rose from the dead on the third day. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. With confidence and trust, let us place our needs before God, our Heavenly Father. For the intentions of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, our Bishop Michael, all our clergy and religious, and for the intentions of all of us present today, we pray to the Lord. For all the holy souls in purgatory, heaven's hospital, we pray to the Lord. For an end to abortion and all sins against the dignity of human life, we pray to the Lord. That through devotion to the most holy Eucharist, our parish community will grow in faith, hope, and love. We pray to the Lord. That many young people will respond to Christ's call to follow him in the consecrated life and in the priesthood. We pray to the Lord. For the grace this week for greater confidence in the authority and power of Jesus in our lives, we pray to the Lord. For those for whom this Mass is being offered, for the sick, and for those who have died, especially Sal Perez, Eddie Barker, and our beloved pastor, Father Mark Beard, we pray to the Lord. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who offers himself in this Eucharist as the perfect and eternal sacrifice for our salvation. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of your presence in our midst. We offer our hearts to you in this moment of prayer. We ask you, Spirit of God, to cleanse us from every sinful desire cast out the unclean spirits in our midst. And we ask too, Holy Mary, you who are queen of angels and saints, to intercede for us now and always before the throne of your Son. Do we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. O Lord, we bring to your altar these offerings of our service. Be pleased to receive them, we pray, and transform them into the sacrament of our redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself to be born of the Virgin. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from unending death, and by rising from the dead, he gave us eternal life. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith.
Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Francis and all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Michael, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you've summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. <coughs> through him, and with him, and in him. O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, O Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sin, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
You shall cross the barren desert, but you shall not die of thirst. You shall wander far in safety, though you do not know the way. You shall speak your words in foreign lands, and all will understand. You shall see the face of God and live. Blessed are your poor, for the kingdom shall be theirs. Blessed are you that weep and mourn, for one day you shall laugh. And if wicked tongues insult and hate you, all because me. Blessed, blessed are you.
Let us pray. Nourished by these redeeming gifts, we pray, O Lord, that through this help to eternal salvation, true faith may ever increase. Through Christ our Lord. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan, who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and that of his Holy Mother, I demand and command that any evil spirits, hexes, vexes, triggers, trances, vows, or demonic blessings among those who have gathered, their loved ones and their possessions, through the authority of Holy Mother Church and the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Savior, Jesus Christ, I bind them separately and individually and break all seals. They are bound and the seals are broken. They are done so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Totally yours, Immaculate Conception, Mary, my mother. Live in me, act in me, speak in me and through me. Think your thoughts in my mind, love through my heart. Give me your dispositions and feelings. Teach me, lead me, and guide me to Jesus. Correct, enlighten, and expand my thoughts and behavior. Possess my soul. Take over my entire personality and life. Replace it with yourself. Incline me to constant adoration. Pray in me and through me. Let me live in you and keep me in this union always. Amen. A couple of important feasts this week. Uh, this week is First Friday and First Saturday. First Friday is also the Feast of the Presentation of the Lord, uh, February the 2nd, so you're all invited if you can come on that day. And on Saturday... February the 3rd, we will celebrate our first Saturday Mass at 8 a.m., but it is also the Feast of St. Blaise. And uh, last Sunday, in fact, I was at the, the shrine of St. Blaise in Dubrovnik, and we had the opportunity to reverence the relic of St. Uh, Blaise, rather, and also to receive the blessing of the throats. And so we will administer the blessing of the throats with the blessed candles, on Saturday morning at the end of the 8 o'clock Mass and also at the end of the 4 o'clock Mass that day. So that's the Feast of St. Blaise. Have a beautiful Sunday, and I thank you for being here today. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace.